All right, cool. We're going to get started. Um, thanks for watching in. I'm Kara Taylor. I'm um, our head of lab operations here at White Labs. Um, and today we're going to be talking a little bit about building a lab on a budget. So some of the things that we can do um, to build a builder lab um, with um, reducing some expenses. So what we're going to do first is uh, there's a little poll that uh, we've put together that's going to pop up on your screen. So um, basically just, you know, selecting what what best describes um, your position or or what you do. Um, and that will help me um, understand our audience. All right. Cool. It's really interesting to see the, the results there. Um, so what we're going to talk about is, you know, looking at some of the um, manufacturing processes and how we can add um, some inexpensive lab tests uh, to that operation. Um, you know, what kind of equipment can you get or, you know, what things can we substitute? And then um, also looking at some documentation options. All right. So, you know, what is, you know, the purpose of building a quality control program? I think that um, I used to have to go over this slide and convince people a little bit more. Um, you know, five, six, seven years ago. But I think, you know, now when people are opening breweries, they're thinking about, you know, what kind of quality control um, can you do or, or will you implement, you know, at that brewery? So, you know, really, you know, why we want to be able to do this is to look at um, consistent beer from batch to batch. And so if you're brewing the same brand, um, you know, you really want to know what that consistent um, fermentation profile is, the flavor profile, the, the rate that that fermentation is going to be um, fermenting. We want to be able to detect, identify, control some of those brewery contaminants. And all of these things allow us to be proactive versus reactive. And so if we can, you know, have some of this data before we um, go to the next beer or um, even the data before we brew, um, you know, in terms of maybe viability or cell counts, all of those things will help us understand how that beer is going to go, um, you know, in that fermentation. And ultimately, you know, this type of quality control program will help you save money, um, potentially from recalls, having better quality product. Um, so, so ultimately, you know, that's some of the goal. So, you know, really when you're building a lab, where do you start? I think the most obvious parts of a lab are the gravities and pH, right? And so these are two things that I would say the majority of brewing, brewers or people, you know, even home brewing are doing, right? So we're looking at starting and final gravities at minimum, and then maybe we're, we're looking at the gravity, you know, over time um, every single day. Um, and then pH monitoring. So I, I find that a lot of people are doing mash pH um, monitoring, but then uh, we're, you know, maybe they're not looking at the starting pH. And so looking at the, the pH uh, at the starting and at the, at the end um, can be a really uh, beneficial uh, part of, of your lab. I would say beyond that, um, the next part is looking at microscopy, right? So owning a microscope, starting with cell counting, viability testing, and then potentially you know, working at that to look at bacteria, um, maybe some gram staining. And um, beyond that, there's some other things that we'll talk about, whether it's forced wort testing, forced firm testing, um, diacetyl. And then um, ultimately, if you really want to get into it, you can look at some microbial plating or even, you know, PCR um, if, if you're wanting to, to detect some of those contaminants. So when we're talking about pH, um, you know, really monitoring the pH is going to do a couple of things for you. 
One, it's pH is going to be a, a measurement of the, that fermentation, right? So even if sometimes maybe you can't see that fermentation happening, if there is fermentation happening, you're going to see that drop in pH. And um, each of your different brands and every strain is going to have a different pH there. So, um, you know, really, if you're monitoring this over time, you can look at what is normal for that brand or normal for that strain. And um, if it's, you know, lower than 3.5, but sometimes even lower than four, there could indicate that there's some spoiled organisms there. So something that's creating acid and that um, is lower than, you know, lower than your normal brand. When um, this is, you know, I have definitely seen this in breweries when you look back at their brew logs, they have, you know, these pH measurements and they're not actually using them to detect before um, to, to understand that potentially there was some spoilage organism there and then it gets to packaging, they test it and realize that um, it was there all along. So something like that can help, help detect that. Um, we also see pH rise as yeast is um, as yeast is is dying, and so that's why at the end of that fermentation you usually see the pH rise a little bit. Um, but you can also measure the pH of your yeast slurry um, if you're you know using it within the first you know couple of weeks, and you can see um, if that pH is rising that you often will have a lot of um, dead cells there. So moving on to gravity measurements, uh, there's a couple different ways that we do this, right? Hydrometer is the most common, refractometer um, is, is common in terms of using it before fermentation is happen happening. We typically don't like to use the refractometer after there's been alcohol introduced as it, it, it doesn't um, deal well with having water, sugar, and alcohol mixed together. Um, but I would say beyond that um, is the digital density meter. And so on the right hand side, you know, there's the uh, handheld Anton Parr um, DMA 35. And, you know, those are really popular now in terms of looking at uh, the density. It's using a YouTube, um, which is a really cool way of measuring. And the nice thing about these type of instruments is that they don't need a lot of sample. So really you only need a couple of mils to be able to take the, the gravity um, versus having you know, to fill something up and um, dropping the hydrometer in there. Um, and a lot of people don't know about this product um, is also called the Easy Dens, which is, a very, is very similar to that handheld, but it's a little different that you use a syringe to, to push it in there. So it doesn't have that plunger, but it brings that cost down to about $500 versus um, that handheld meter is around, I forget now, it's like two to three grand, right? And um, so it is a, a, a unit that you can, that is more affordable and allows you to get you, give you a digital reading. Um, it just connects to an iPhone or an iPad um, or some other, you know, type of electronic device like that, and it will read the density on there. Um, contrary to popular belief, it will not do alcohol, right? So there's a different unit for that, um, but it will do to gravity. So moving on to microscopy, um, you know, with these, with a microscope, you can do cell, co cell counting, um, yeast viability, looking at the cell morphology. I think that it's really important that um, you know what each of your strains that you use in the brewery look like under the microscope. They all don't look the same. And so just getting to know what they look like can be really helpful when you're um, looking, at, uh, looking at the slurry there. And so some of the things that to look for when you're looking for a microscope um, is that you wanna be able to look at having a movable slide, or sorry, stage. So you can see here that um, on this one, it has a little dial for the stage and that will help you move the sample around. If it just has two clips on there and you're putting the, the slide under there, that's not going to be helpful. Um, and it would be very difficult to, to count cells. So you wanna make sure you have an adjustable slide. Um, and the other major thing is that you wanna make sure that it goes up to 1000 X. So uh, a lot of, Cheaper microscopes might only go up to 400x, but um, you want to make sure it goes up to 1,000x so you can look at bacteria. 
I would say, you know, you can really spend up to, you know, you can spend a lot of money on a microscope, but um, microscopes are really hardy. You know, two of the microscopes we have here are probably over 20 years old. And so I think, um, you know, really you can find a used microscope and get it cleaned up really well. Um, but you can also get some really great student microscopes just for these purposes of looking at bacteria and looking at cell counting that are under $200. Um, a lot of our microscopes that we have purchased for the classes are, are basically at, uh, you know, are from Amazon under 200 bucks and are just considered to be student microscopes. Um, granted, I think uh, if you're getting a lot of use out of them, you know, if you're using it every single day, you might want to invest in something a little bit more robust, but you know, there's really a lot of options um, for that. Um, okay, so moving on, you know, if we want to do viability and vi um, vi viability staining, there's a couple different ways that we can do it. Um, and I would say the most popular method is going to be the citrate methylene blue um, or the alkaline methylene violet stain. So one is really just staining them blue, one is staining them purple. And I can't really say, you know, why uh, people use one or the other. I would say that methylene blue is the industry standard. And then um, people have, you know, tried other methods. Um, maybe they came from a different industry and it's a lot of personal preference. And then you just sort of correlate it to the results that you see um, in the fermentations. So basically consistency is key here in terms of the method. Um, and, you know, really being able to do this is, is is that it's quick and it's easy and it's inexpensive. Originally, it might not feel quick and it might not feel easy, but over time, as you're getting used to doing this, it, it will become a lot easier for you. Um, but, you know, really one of the issues with this is that it can be really inaccurate if you're not trained properly or you don't have a really good method. And so if you have four, you know, even two, three, four, five people doing this kind of method at the brewery, um, I can guarantee you they're going to come up with different results from different, each person every single time. So um, it's definitely, you know, crucial to, to train really well and, you know, to really keep the, the testing to a, a small amount of people. So really, you know, you need a hemocytometer for this. Um, and those are, unfortunately, it's difficult to, to get those on a cheaper budget. So it is probably something that you're, you're going to have to splurge on. I find that if you do find them for really cheap, you know, around $10, $20, it's likely um, that they are sort of knockoffs and, and don't work very well. We've, we've found that over the years. So um, if, if there's something you're going to, you know, allocate some, some of the budget to, it's definitely this, this item. So what are some of the other procedures that we can do um, from a quality perspective that don't require a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of infrastructure or machinery? Um, some of these are listed here and then we'll go through them. So for wor forced wort testing, uh, this is basically looking at the cleanliness of our hot side or uh, right after the heat exchanger. So, you know, before the, the heat exchanger, the hot side um, and the cooling aspect. Uh, forced fermentation, testing, you know, really our yeast performance and looking at that final gravity. Uh, forced diacetyl testing, so looking at that diacetyl, diacetyl precursor, looking at how much diacetyl is residual in that beer, and then uh, some looking at some HLP testing, so some uh, being able to test for lacto or PDO on fermenting beer um, or finished beer or even wort. So um, when we look at forced wort testing, really all we need is a flask or a mason jar to be able to sanitize it. Um, you can also use uh, those Whirlflock bags. Those are pretty popular and those are already gamma irradiated. They're literally pennies, I believe. Um, those are really popular, but you know, all you have to do is collect that wort right after the heat exchanger. And so you've got to put a sample valve there. You've got to be able to take a good sample, you know, a clean sample, but that will allow you to look at the microbial stability from that point and be um, in backwards, right? So it's really testing to see if your heat exchanger is clean. And um, all we're going to do is, you know, either put some foil over the top of that flask. We can put, um, 
yeah, or the mason jar, or we just tie up that oral flock bag. And so if you're seeing some bubbles or you're seeing some cloudiness, you know, within one, two, three days, that means that there is some contamination that's happening at that point. Um, we know that heat exchangers can be um, notorious for, you know, collecting junk and, and being an issue for contamination. And so uh, this is a really great way to sort of ensure that your processes are clean up into that point. If that, if that wart sample is not fermenting or doesn't look like it's, you know, clouding up within, you know, six, seven days, that means you've got a pretty good cleaning procedure there um, and, and you're good and good to go from there. I think this allows you to be, this is a really easy method. It's, you know, really inexpensive to do and allows you to be proactive in that if there is an issue later in the beer, um, you can ensure that it's likely that it did not come from that before, you know, the heat exchanger there. So it's a, a good method to, to look at for cleaning. So the next one that I think is one of the most important ones that I, I think that most breweries can do is a forced fermentation. So um, a forced fermentation is basically adding wort and overpitching yeast in a flask um, or a mason jar, anything that will basically hold, you know, hold a, a larger volume of liquid and fermenting it quickly. So there's a couple ways that we can do that. We can heat it. Um, you know, we could get it really warm so it can ferment quickly. We can put it on a stir plate and heat it um, to get it to ferment quicker. But ideally, we want this fermentation done within, you know, 48 hours, 72 hours. And what this is going to tell us is what is the maximum final gravity of that wort. And so if that maximum, you know, final gravity is 10, 12, but our beer is constantly hitting, um, you know, 10, 17, we know that there's some extra fermentables there. And, you know, this is a really easy method to do as long as you have the, uh, the ability to collect the wart in something and, and sanitize it um, and also be able to keep it, keep it warm and then take the gravity of it, of that final gravity. So, you know, it's really, I think can be really powerful, especially if you're having issues with any type of exploding or over carbonating cans or bottles, or if you're continuously having issues with stuck fermentations uh, or, or fermentations that just aren't drying out. You can see if it's a, a yeast issue or you can see if it's a, a, a wart um, or mash issue. So after that, I think this one is, is pretty common, especially if you have some diacetyl issues, but um, doing a forced diacetyl is really helpful for understanding when your beer is done. And for this, we just need the ability to collect two samples. They can be done in plastic, they can be done in mason jars, they can be done in flasks. But we just need two samples from that, that um, beer that's basically done fermenting. And we're gonna put one into a water bath and we're gonna put one at room temperature. We'll, we'll put the one in the water bath in there for 10 to 20 minutes um, and basically allow it to cool after that and then we smell them side by side and what we're doing is we're taking that precursor of diacetyl the alpha acetolactate and we're forcing it to become diacetyl in that sample and that's going to help us determine whether or not this beer needs to um, either be warmed up a little bit to convert that alpha acetolactate or it's going to basi basically tell us um, whether or not we're going to have issues you know with the the shelf life of that beer later on and so if that room temperature beer doesn't smell like diacetyl and um, the heated beer doesn't smell like diacetyl, then um, you know, that beer is typically ready to package. If that um, room temperature beer is negative and the heated beer smells like diacetyl, that means there's precursor there. That means we've got to raise the temperature in that tank. We've got to recirculate that yeast to potentially get that down um, if you feel like there isn't a lot of yeast still in suspension. And if the room temperature beer smells like diacetyl and the heated beer is also positive, you know, then that means you've got a lot of diacetyl there. It means that there's either potentially a contamination or it just, that beer um, is definitely gonna need some more time with the yeast there. So um, if you know anything about diacetyl testing, you know, if you really wanna get a value on this, you need a lot more equipment. Um, a gas chromatograph can cost, you know, 50 to 60 
grand, maybe even more. Um, and so this test is really helpful to, to do pass or fails, but I think what can happen is there's sometimes people that, that diacetyl and maybe some hop or caramel flavors can be kind of confusing. And so you really have to have a good, um, some good tr trained people that know what diacetyl smells like. Of course, if you're kind of blind to diacetyl, you feel like it's not one of your strong points, this test isn't for you. You gotta find the person at the brewery that can really um, uh, help you decide, you know, whether or not these are pass or goes. And uh, so to move on to the micro side, you know, really one of my favorite medias is called um, Sue's Lactobacillus and Pediococcus media, which is uh, more commonly referred to as HLP. And this detects lacto and pedio. Um, and really the reason that I love this is that it's really easy to use and um, doesn't require an autoclave or doesn't require a pressure cooker. Um, you can just microwave this media and put it into a, a tube. And so basically you're just putting it into a 15 mil conical, or sorry, a, a conical tube of any, any size, really. Um, there's some different ways you can do it, but in our, in, in our method, we use 15 mil conicals, um, which is you know, sort of in that photo there. And uh, then you just incubate it for five to seven days. If you don't have the ability to, you know, to put it in a warmer incubator, you can incubate it just for a longer period of time and take a look at it then. Um, if you do have, you know, major contamination, you'll often see, you know, growth in that with much less than five days. So five to seven days is really looking for, you know, those low levels of contaminants there. And so you can see in that photo, um, there's sort of some haziness in the tube. And so basically, if there's some growth there, you'll see it in that tube. If you're interested in this, a really great way to get started on this is that we have an HLP test kit that has all the items in there for you to be able to do this. And so you can do, you know, six or seven samples and try it out, try out the method. Um, the, the media is already pre-made and you just microwave it. Um, and that can be a really great way to get started and trying to figure it out um, and how to sort of incorporate it into your brewery. Um, this is a test that you can do at any point, yeast slurry, final beer, wart. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can, can use it. And it's also an anaerobic test in that when we put it into a tube, um, we're tightening that cap and there isn't any oxygen going in there. So just looking at some ways to save money, um, some of these are photos of, of breweries that I've visited or, you know, some of my former students have sort of sent me. Um, one of the things that I love is trying to find some adapters for microscopes in it because I think if you don't use a microscope daily, it can be kind of taxing and it's difficult and you're trying to share these results with someone else. Um, there's a lot of really cool 3D printed things um, that, you know, you can put your, your cell phone, your camera and attach it to the, the lens on the microscope. Um, I don't have like a specific brand, but I've definitely found some online. And um, if you've ever tried it, you can just use your cell phone camera and kind of zoom up through the lens um, the, or the eyepiece. And, but it can be a little difficult to hold still and get it right. Um, so these tools kind of help you do that. There are some adapters for, uh, for microscopes or cameras, but they're either really expensive or the quality isn't very good. So just kind of be aware of that when looking at them. Um, I think most people's cell phones probably have a higher quality than a lot of the microscope cameras. Um, some other things, one of my favorites is that old Mecklenburg brewery that I visited. Um, that top photo there is a lab that they, that they built out and um, that entire lab that was built out was done with an Ikea kitchen set. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times when you're looking for lab caseware, or when you're building out a lab, um, just adding the word lab to that you know, skyrockets the price. And so I thought this was a really cool um, way to be able to, to sort of make something look really nice, um, but also, you know, keep the cost down. Um, you don't, if you don't have the ability to put in hard gas lines, there's a lot of options for portable flames. And a lot of breweries are actually, or sorry, a lot of laboratories are moving towards this for safety precautions anyways, but you can get some portable flames. I don't really recommend the oil lamps. It's a little old school. And I don't find that the, the oil lamps really make, or are hot enough to really make a good convection current, but it can certainly be done. 
Um, the sous vide for a water bath, this is something that we use all the time here. Water baths are like weirdly expensive, um, mainly because they're usually holding temperature in a lab for, you know, very tightly. We don't need that in a brewery. And so, um, you know, you can find the sous vide cookers for usually under $150 um, to be able to make a, a water bath. So it's a great way to be able to do that for diacetyl testing. Do-it-yourself incubators. There's a lot of YouTube tutorials on this online, and they're mostly for making chicken, like incubators for chicken eggs. Um, but you can still use some of those same principles for anything you want to do for incubating um, plates. I've I've seen some people put some things together with styrofoam um, and heat lamps. So there's a lot of options that you can do that um, if you can't find some used equipment. Um, a couple other things that we've done is just like when you're looking at lab dishwashers, they're really expensive. We have generic dishwashers just from, you know, household ones, really easy. Um, you know, I like to say that not only do you want to save money, but you also want to save time because, you know, as a cliche, time is money. And so if there's certain things you can do to help, um, you know, really save some of that time, like having a dishwasher for some of this glassware, I think is, can be really helpful. And um, look at generic lab supplies. So a lot of times, um, you know, lab supplies can be really expensive because they have some quality standards that, you know, maybe something that's doing pharmaceuticals or something food grade, you know, really needs. But a lot of times we don't need those type of specifications um, for our products. And uh, you can find a lot of, you know, things online now, but we don't need, you know, the top of the line all the time. We can, we can get some more generic products. So just in terms of software, um, you know, there isn't a ton out there for brewery lab software right now. I mean, there, there are some more custom or, you know, boutique options, but really, you know, for something that if you're looking at a budget, we find that uh, Google Docs really works for us really well, especially if you have someone on your team that can really um, play around with them. There's a lot of things that you can add on to Google Docs um, and Google Sheets, and it is free if you have a Gmail account. Um, and then it allows everyone to be able to look at the data. You can look at it from your phone, um, an app from your phone. It's really easy to share. So it's one of the things that we like a lot. And we found um, a lot of versatility with it. If you just, um, if you play around with it a little bit, and also if you have anyone on your staff that can kind of, you know, maybe has some programming that can, you know, make some graphs and charts um, a little bit more accessible for you guys. But it, overall, I think it's a, a great software to be able to use for this. So what are some of the ways that you can save money or where can you do this? Um, for sourcing some inexpensive lab equipment, I really love eBay. A lot of times on eBay, people don't even know that what they have and so they're selling it and and that you end up getting a great deal. You do kind of have to scour things a lot or save searches and, and get eBay to sort of, you know, maybe look for you while you're not on there all the time. But I find some really good um, buys on eBay. Labx.com is sort of similar to an eBay, um, but it's only lab, um, lab materials. So, you know, that's um, an option also. I would say if you're, depending on what your budget is and where you live, um, Biosurplus or American Laboratory Trading both have great resources for um, used equipment. But I would say that even then the price range isn't always, isn't always that great. Sometimes they're higher in equipment, just older. Um, so you just kind of have to look around, but sometimes they're willing to make you deals also. So it doesn't hurt to email. And then uh, I would say if you live near a university, there's sometimes they have university auctions for their lab equipment. You have to dig a little bit, but I know, you know, just being here in San Diego, um, UCSD has uh, a full site of just lab equipment that they are usually getting rid of from their university. Um, Amazon, and I would say, you know, Googling some of the stuff is your friend. You know, really we can get a lot of things so much cheaper now than we ever used to be able to or or is more accessible for us um, and so I find that you can find some really inexpensive single-use plastic items whether it's pipettes gloves um, those things are really easy um, to find now on on Amazon or even just with a quick Google search 
So some other things you can think about is, um, you know, like I said before, time, <laughs> time is money. And so you can do some of these things if you're looking to get into to more microbial plating and don't want to invest in all the equipment and the time to be able to do it is getting some pre-poured auger plates. Um, we make those. Um, also, you can get prepared viability stains, so they're just ready to go versus having to put the um, put all the ingredients together and make it. Um, we also sell that for methylene blue, methylene violet, or even um, EDTA if you're trying to use that to help the cells uncoagulate a little bit, um, like some of the English strains. Um, and then looking at any disposable or single use things. And so, you know, I know that um, in a world in which we're trying to use less plastics and less single use things, there are sometimes trade offs for that. And um, there are things that can allow you to just use single use, throw it away or recycle it and um, be able to move on versus having to wash all of those things or, um, you know, clean them all out, re autoclave them or re sanitize them or sterilize them. Well, and then so, um, you know, there's some other ways to be able to do this in terms of just looking at analytical services. So doing either some testing packages um, that we offer or even looking at our big QC days. So this is a great package if you want to be able to have some of these values or even compare them to your in-house lab um, is, you know, it's two beers that get um, analyzed for diastole, IBUs, alcohol, all the attenuation values, calories, um, color, and also micro for that. Um, and you can also add on gluten. So it's a pretty good deal. Um, and we do it once a quarter. So for this one, you have to order by May 15th. Um, but some of these things, you know, can help you to, to sort of outsource it versus, um, you know, buying all that equipment in-house if it's just for a couple things. Cool. Well, um, you know, really, I think there's some easy ways to get started. I'll um, answer questions from the Q&A. So if you want to put any of your questions in there, um, basically, I'll answer those questions until 11. So you can either hang out and listen to some of those questions or you can, um, or you can say goodbye. Um, and uh, my email is just Kara, K-A-R-A, at whitelabs.com. So if there's something you think about tomorrow or next week, um, feel free to, to send me an email. And thanks for joining. Okay, so I will start first with... Um, so as far as forced fermentation, are there are a number of cells per mill that you recommend um, to overpitch. So um, the method, the ASBC method for that is a little outdated. Um, and so it's a little difficult. So it says to use five grams. I believe that is per liter. But um, what I would say is I would just do at least double or triple what you would be adding normally. Um, we basically add for one liter, we'll add a bit, uh, about 10 mils of yeast to it. Um, but it just needs to be a blatant sort of over pitching. If you wanted to see um, what that wort combination was with that yeast, it's a little different in that you actually calculate the cell count that you've added to that beer. Um, and by keeping it warmer, um, you'll just sort of look at how that yeast, that, that combination is. So um, it's a little bit difficult to answer depending on how you're gonna use it, but I, I would say, you know, whatever you think is, a, is sort of a two to three times the amount you would normally pitch. Um, what is the name or tool for forced hot side testing? Um, I think I was maybe talking about a whirl pack bag and they're like these little, um, they're little, they look like Ziplocs, but they have, um, you, you sort of twirl them like this and, and they close at the top and they're already gamma irradiated and they're about pennies and they come in different sizes. So you'll have to look for that, but whirl pack. Um, and I can have Eric type that in the chat also. Um, force. Oh, the pick of the samples colored blue and green. That was just from, that's just a, a stock photo for that type of product. No indicators. Um, so if you want more detailed descriptions of how to perform some of these tests, a lot of them are in Chris White's book. Um, yeast, the guide, the practical guide to fermentation. We do also have some of them on our, our website. Um, and um, we also teach a lot of these in our, our yeast essentials courses. Um, for the four 
So for the forced acid test, uh, there's, there are some different ways of doing it, but if you're only doing it for 10 to 20 minutes, you want to get it to that 140 to 160 Fahrenheit range um, to get that conversion, but it could probably be a little bit lower. You just, you would just leave it for an extended period of time. Um, and uh, you, we just don't want to boil it. That's basically all you don't want to do because diacetyl is volatile. And so if you boil it, um, you're potentially, you know, losing some of that, uh, some of the, those aromas. Um, So um, in terms of the forced fermentation, a yeast strain can um, give you, it, it could be different from forced fermentation to forced fermentation or from strain to strain, I mean, but um, when you're over pitching like that, you usually have more than enough cells to get the job done, so to speak. So as long as that strain ferments maltose um, versus if you're using some, you know, kind of maybe wild yeast or something of that sort, um, as long as that strain from ferments maltose, if you over pitch it, it will dry out that beer. Um, if you're, if you're trying to, if you're trying to look at whether or not that yeast is, is viable enough, then you would want to choose a different, um, a different protocol. Um, so someone was saying that they've had an issue with um, lactobacillus or lactic acid bacteria. Um, do you recommend verifying the CIP has been effective? Okay, so figuring out how, how your um, CIP has been uh, is effective. There's a couple different ways. One, you can test your rinse water using that um, HLP that I was showing you there. Um, the other way that you can do this is you can look at using an ATP meter. And so the ATP meters are a little expensive, but I think are a good investment in, in a lab. Um, they're usually around 1500 and then the, you have to buy the consumables, but basically it's a swab that's telling you if there's anything that's um, alive there uh, that, that's showing any sort of ATP, uh, any energy. And so I think that could be a good investment, something to look into. Um, when creating a brewery floor plan, how much space do you recommend? Um, I would say, you know, we used to put a brewery floor plan in some of these lectures, and I think that it really differs for everybody. So I think you have to, I, what I recommend is trying to build it bigger. If you're building something, build it bigger than you think you'll need. That is always um, what, you know, I've, I've built, I've been here and we've built like three, maybe four facilities. And even when I feel like this is, it's been too, it was too much, it ends up being not big enough always. So as, as it grows, um, and trying to think about some of the things like electrical or gas ahead of time. Um, I just really recommend trying to not share the break room or anywhere there's food. Um, that always sort of becomes a mess, which I see more often than not. Um, Some of these I'm going to skip potentially because they're not lab related. Um, so if you want to start a propagation um, process for, you know, for yeast, you do have to invest in some, some nicer equipment. So we, we definitely recommend having a benchtop autoclave. Um, and needing some, maybe a laminar flow hood. So all of those things aren't, I wouldn't consider to be like budget items, but though they are things that you can find um, on the internet really. Um, and like I said, it's some of the places I was talking about eBay or some of the used lab supplies um, online. Um, but we do have a list on our website or um, also again in the yeast book that has some of those, those items in order to, to start that. Um, Is there a guide available for revitalizing new yeast that is out of date? Uh, we do have some items on our website in terms of for making starters. Um, I also um, have a PowerPoint on that uh, that I did at HomebrewCon last year. Um, but you know, if something is out of date, you know, really you have to to get it revitalized and and making sure that it, there is enough cells there to be able to make new cells. Um, and so, really, the ways that you would want to do that is starting it in a smaller smaller batch. So if you're on the homebrew size, it could be a flask. 
Um, and if you're on the brewery size side, it could be maybe a smaller fermenter, maybe a three barrel, maybe a half barrel keg that's been modified and getting it started there and then trying to, to prop it up from, from there. Um, and then if you are doing a method like that, you know, employing some of these, uh, looking at viability and vital or viability um, stains and cell counting is really important because uh, it can be really difficult to really know how that yeast is going to play out if we don't have that information. So um, definitely something to add if, if you're if you're trying to, to work on that. Um, do we recommend any brands or uh, models of microscopes from Amazon? Um, we The one that we sell is Celestron, which if you look at the brand, you'd probably recognize it. They make other um, telescopes and cameras and things. Uh, but I would say there's a brand that starts with an A. Those are the, the ones that we have from for the student microscopes for the most part. Um, again, they work well if you're probably using them about once a week or maybe twice a week, not every single day or um, you know multiple times a day. Some of the things, the parts just kind of start to fall out. But um, but definitely a good a good starter. Um, Uh, someone is asking if the breweries are doing something to yeast that we wouldn't be able to harvest them from beer bottles. Um, not necessarily. You can always um, try harvesting things from beer bottles, but because there's a lot of alcohol there and there's a lot of CO2 buildup in a, in a beer bottle, um, the yeast end up dying off or end up being very stressed. And so therefore, you know, it can be kind of uh, difficult to, to harvest them or get yeast that's in a really good condition. Um, there also might be multiple strains in there, depending on that that beer has been um, made. So um, just some, something to think about when using lees. Um, so, and then I think uh, one of the ones I guess I didn't completely answer was um, when looking at plates or slants in a brewing setting, is it, you know, is, is yeast propagating um, something that can save you money in a brewery? Of course, making your own yeast could essentially, but you have to think about how long that process is. Um, so recently when working with a client on this, um, you know, you really have to have someone dedicated to the yeast props and a team that's looking at them, you know, every single, usually almost every single day as through their, um, through the life cycle. And, um, you know, propping from a slant, it can take, um, you know, weeks to be able to do that, to get to the size that you need um, for that beer so and for testing it and those purposes so again if you have staff that could be something that could that could be worked out but if you don't it could be very difficult and you end up spending more money on people and um, and equipment and potentially if you're if you're not testing it you know maybe spoiled beer so there's definitely some trade-offs there for sure um, all right. I think that is that it, right? All right, cool. Well, thank you guys so much. Again, my email is Kara, K-A-R-A at whitelabs.com. And if you, um, you know, have some other questions, feel free to reach out and um, contact me. Thanks again, guys. Have a good Wednesday.